uh, I am very honored. Uh, this panel is held in cooperation with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, with which we have um, at Reichmann University and at the Lauder School of Government and at ICT, we are privileged to have a long-standing relationship with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, and it's really our pleasure to hold this panel today uh, in cooperation with the uh, Stiftung. So first of all, I would like to invite to the podium uh, the Deputy Ambassador of Germany to Israel, Dr. Jörg Andreas Valandi. Uh, uh, please take the floor, the floor is yours. I would like to just uh, introduce you um, uh, briefly. So Dr. Andreas Valandi entered the Foreign Service in 2006. Um, he's uh, served for one year in the German army. Uh, he has a master's degree in legal theory from the European Academy of Legal Theory and a PhD uh, in energy law from the Humboldt Universität uh, to Berlin. Uh, he speaks English, French, Spanish, and I heard rumors that he also speaks some Hebrew and some Arabic. So maybe he'll give us a little demonstration in his five minutes. Um, he's also published a crime novel uh, on a case in Algeria in the wake of the Arab Spring. So I think we need like an Amazon link for that novel. Uh, that would be great. So uh, Deputy Ambassador, you have the floor, and then I will pass the floor to uh, Beatrice. Well, many thanks. Um, uh, shalom, chaverim, uh, chaverot. I'm uh, more than delighted and honored um, uh, to speak to you. Um, sorry, it's um, it's it's me, um, the this Ganscha Greer, Beshagerud Germania. Um, Ambassador Steffen Seibert sends his regards. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it this morning. Um, I'll make it brief. I promise. Um, as as we as we can see, this meeting already brings together very esteemed experts and political voices from both uh, countries and uh, from Europe and the, and the Middle East. It highlights once again the reliable and professional cooperation between Europe, Germany and Israel in the field of counterterrorism. Uh, Zahri Hanekbi was here this morning and actually it's just a few days back that um, he was in Berlin because we had the second round of the German-Israeli strategic dialogue on foreign and security policy in, in, in Berlin. We there also sat down, we compared notes on threats posed by terrorism. We found out how deep and trustworthy our cooperation actually became. And for a German diplomat, of course, against the backdrop of the Shoah, this is and will always be a real miracle. It is a miracle that enables us to develop a joint approach on terrorism and sometimes even to develop joint answers. The one issue I would like to highlight as an example of our cooperation is, of course, Iran and its proxies. As you know, in April 2020, Berlin banned all activities by Hezbollah in Germany. I think it is safe to say that data received from close friends on Hezbollah's terror activities in Europe and Germany was helpful in this respect. And uh, we learned another thing too, and I think you might, uh, you might discuss this a bit later today. Um, we also learned that no, not all data gathered by intelligence can always be used as forensic evidence in courts. This, how can we translate intelligence into forensic evidence used in courts is probably one issue that you discuss among experts uh, yourself and maybe even today. Um, having said this, Sometimes we are still working on a joint understanding, as for instance the Russian-Iranian cooperation against Ukraine. Moscow, this is our, our German, our European reading um, in, um, of this extremely unholy alliance, is becoming even more dangerous and ruthless by cooperating with Tehran. We therefore, and this comes as no surprise, wish for an even stronger commitment by our Israeli friends against the Russian war of aggression, especially with regards to offensive capabilities. Israel, and this is how it is discussed here, on the other hand, sometimes argues just the other way around. Same assessment, but the argument goes the other way around by saying that the alliance between Moscow and Tehran should be an eye-opener for naive Europeans showing us how bad Tehran really is. So bad that they even support Moscow. Well, in the end, we probably might agree that both visions are somewhat correct. So um, let us work on practical consequences. And I also hope that this might be one of the outcomes of this, of this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe, and especially Germany, I admit we came a long way. 
our first German national security strategy came into being just a few months ago, but it clearly underlines the importance of an ever closer cooperation with our value partners. Israel figures prominently in this strategy as one of only three nations directly mentioned in this document. And looking at the recent German-Israeli deal on Arrow 3, Israel will become an even closer ally. In this sense, and once again, I'm delighted and honored being with you today, and I wish you all the best for the upcoming exchange. Many thanks. Toda Rabah. Thank you so much, Deputy Ambassador. Uh, it is now my pleasure to uh, invite to the floor Dr. Beatrice Goravanci, uh, who, um, who heads the, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, office in Israel, in Jerusalem. Um, Dr. Goravanci holds a PhD in political science from the Saar University in Germany. She's been with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation since 1992. Um, she started in Turkey, then went on to the Philippines, then a little bit back to Germany, then Thailand, France, India, um, and she uh, headed and created the CAS Regional Program Political Dialogue Asia and the Pacific based in Singapore. Um, since 2021, she, we've been privileged to have Dr. Uh, Gorajansi with us uh, here in Israel as she uh, started heading the CAS Israel office in Jerusalem. And it's our pleasure to uh, do this panel with you and to work with you um, all year long, really, not just uh, for this conference. So thank you very much for your friendship, and you have the floor. Many thanks, Daphne, for the kind introduction, and many thanks, Jörg Valendi, for your opening remarks by presenting the German, but also at the same time global perspective, and thus setting the tone for today's panel. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, it is really my pleasure to also welcome you to our panel on Europe, Shared Threats and Lessons Learned. And I must say that we as the Konrad Adenauer Foundation do support specifically this panel for the 11th year in a row now. And we are very happy that once again we managed to gather together such a distinguished panel as we have it today. Ladies and gentlemen, terrorist attacks across the world and in Europe show the extent of the unabated threat citizens face from all forms of violent extremism. The threat is diverse and geographically diffused. It remains significant, complex, and unpredictable. The challenges that demand action from Europe, from the EU, and its partners are numerous. Threats arise from the consequent risk of radicalization and violent extremism being propagated in local communities within the EU and beyond, evolutions in money laundering and terrorism financing, and the possible re-emergence, resurgence, like of other terrorist actors, terrorist sleeper cells and low-key loan operators. Emerging technologies and an increasingly aggressive terrorist propaganda online lead to new challenges. So fighting terrorism is thus a top priority for the EU. Member states work closely together to prevent terrorist attacks and ensure the security of citizens. Although responsibility for combating crime and safeguarding security primarily lies with the member states, recent years terrorist attacks have shown that this is also a common responsibility which they must shoulder together. The EU contributes to the protection of its citizens by acting as the main forum for cooperation and coordination among member states. And as a consequence, Europe is not only expected to participate in the global fight against terrorism, but to move forward. And this cannot be done without like-minded partners, or as Jörg Valendi put it, without value partners like Israel or the United States. With this, I do not want to further elaborate because our experts are in a much better position to do so. Thank you very much for being here today and I'm looking forward to an inspiring panel. Thank you.
thank you, Beatrice. Again, uh, 11th year. I thought, I thought it was a, a long-standing relationship, but 11th year is, is a nice, uh, nice title. Um, thank you again. So it is my pleasure now to uh, introduce our distinguished experts and panelists uh, uh, today. Um, and I will, uh, I will introduce them all uh, now, and then I will give them the floor so we can, um, we can enjoy their wisdom. Uh, so first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dina Lisniansky, uh, who's has a long CV, but the most important thing she has on it is that she's an adjunct lecturer at the Lauder School of Government, Diplomacy, and Strategy here at Reichmann University. She's a geopolitical expert. She specializes in the Middle East, uh, Islam, Europe, and extremism. Um, she consults on political and religious issues concerning the EU and the UK, focusing on security and extremism. Uh, I would like to introduce now Dr. Magnus Ranstorp, who is also a leading expert in counterterrorism and countering violent extremism. Um, Magnus uh, developed the Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence at the University of St. Andrews um, and is also a researcher on Hezbollah. Uh, he currently serves as the strategic advisor at the Center for Societal Security at the Swedish Defense University and is also a special advisor for the EU Radicalization Awareness Network. Dr. Guido Steinberg is a prominent Islamicist who works at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs and has previously advised the Chancellery on international terrorism. He has served as an expert witness in major trials against Islamist terrorists in various countries um, and um, he's also a commentator on Middle East affairs and terrorism for various uh, media and uh, key publications. Last but not least, um, I'd like to, pre to introduce you to Dr. Lorenzo Vidino, who's the director um, of the program on extremism at George Washington University and a leading expert on Islamism in Europe and North America. Um, he's, uh, heard, he's held research uh, jobs and roles at Harvard Belfer Center, the US Institute for Peace, and the Rand Corporation. Um, uh, he's written a book, The New Muslim Brotherhood in the West, uh, in which he, he discusses uh, the organizing of Islamic uh, groups in Western countries. And finally, I'm Dr. Richmond Barak. I'm your moderator for today's session, and I'm here from the Lauder School of Government and ICT in-house. Um, and I also would like to thank Naomi and Felix from the Konrad Enanauer Stiftung for their assistance in making this happen uh, and for their um, cooperation. So without further ado, I would like to be of the game, I'm moving to this microphone, hopefully it works, yes. The rules of the game is that you're each going to get five minutes to present what you view as the main threats and lessons um, with regard to the development, evolution of the terrorist threat in Europe. Um, I suggest we do it in the order of uh, seating. Are you ready, Lorenzo? Sure. Okay. Sure. So, Lorenzo, you have the floor. Yeah, I think you have your oh, own. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, and real pleasure to be to be here again to be at ICT, and thank you very much to the Adenauer Stiftung for the the hospitality. Um, well, yeah, difficult where we're now. Um, you know, a couple of days ago I was penning the op-ed that I guess a lot of people are uh, here uh, right a few days before the anniversary of 9/11, which becomes a, an opportunity not only to. Uh, think about what happened on that tragic day, but also to kind of assess where the jihadist movement is, whether in the West, in Europe, or uh, globally. And I went back to reading some of the op-eds that I wrote actually the very first time I came to ICT, that's 2010. And if we assess the jihadist movement in Europe in 2010, I think we have painted a picture that would be probably very similar to now. I think most of us are quite optimistic. Jihadism was on the decline and we would have been all completely wrong. And in fact, I was embarrassed reading what I wrote uh, 13 years ago in terms of, oh, jihadism is almost gone, it's quiet. We all know that six months later, a whole new wave started. And I think it's the idea of phases, uh, waves. Uh, it's probably the best way to look at jihadism. In Europe, it's been a 40-year-long phenomenon. And over these 40 years, we have seen ebbs and flows, ups and downs in activities. All of them basically determined by events that have taken place geopolitically outside of Europe. It's a conflict in Afghanistan. It's, um, well, Bosnia was in, in, inside Europe, uh, uh, Iraq, uh, invasion of Iraq, and of course, then everything that happened in Syria and Iraq uh, starting in 2011, 2012. What we, uh, the way I think it's reasonable to see it is that in Europe we've always had bubbles of sympathy for jihadism, individuals, networks that adopt jihadist ideology. They always operate. Of course, they're very different from country to country. Uh, we can really go at the local level and see differences. Uh, but these networks exist. 
what changes over time is this, the size and the direction that these, uh, these hubs, these networks take. And every time we see some big phenomenon outside of, uh, of the borders of Europe, generally the size uh, increases uh, and the direction is determined. So obviously 10 years ago, we had the movement to Syria unprecedented with five, 6,000 individuals from Europe traveling. Uh, we're now at a stage in which globally the activities are uh, much lower, with obviously the glaring exception of, uh, of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. But generally speaking, we don't have that attractive poll that the Syrian conflict constituted a few years ago, whether from an ideological or from a logistical point of view. There's no theater that represents even remotely what Syria represented 10 years ago. And so we find ourselves in Europe in a situation in which networks do exist, individuals, whether sort of isolated and operating only online or connected to other people, both in the, physical, uh, in the um, virtual and the physical space, operate, uh, but they don't have a clear direction. Uh, whether it's ideological or more logistical, physical, but they do exist. And in fact, we, uh, even though the media, of course, for understandable reasons, reports this incident significantly less. Ten years ago, the smallest attack would receive enormous media attention. Now we, we see very little of that. But we do see here, and the TSAT report makes it, makes it very clear, we do see attacks, although all of them over the last few years of a relatively small scale, but we have seen larger attacks being thwarted, which I think to me is a um, testament of the fact that uh, throughout Europe we see a much higher preparedness when it comes to law enforcement and intelligence agency, whether that's because at the national level, pretty much all countries have gotten better. I think the level of preparation that existed in uh, some European countries, perhaps those that historically were less touched by terrorism, 10 years ago was relatively low when it comes to capabilities, to legal tools, uh, to just sort of a culture of being ready to deal with a certain phenomenon was very uneven 10 years ago, and I think things have gotten much better throughout the continent. I think, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm not here because I, there's several people with, uh, who are hold or have held senior positions at Europol, I'm speaking about uh, Manuel Navarrete, um, Europol has played a much, much bigger role in coordinating uh, activities, and I think in general we're at a better stage. So, but that leads to the, to the assessment, which is again Europol's assessment, but pretty much every European country is that the threat is still very much there. It just lacks the same strong direction that it had just five, six years ago. Uh, but it still represents the main challenge to pretty much all, uh, all European countries. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, thank you very much. And uh, Dina? Yeah. Hello. It's very good to be here and to see everyone here. And um, if to continue what you have just said, Lorenzo, <clears throat> I think that the main challenge that we see now is uh, how to prevent. Basically, uh, in the last <clears throat> couple of decades, this is all we've been doing. We've been thinking about prevention. We've been talking about all kinds of coordinated programs in the EU, uh, in, in the EU states, and also in the UK. And um, most of these programs were somewhat successful, some of them more than the others. And uh, when I speak with you today, before I came here, I checked again what kind of programs had the better su success rate than the others. And um, actually, we found out that recently the PREVENT program in the UK was considered to be more successful than many other um, organizations that try to work in the UK or in EU, state, um, EU states. So, in fact, in February this year, the Council of Europe decided to uh, go for a new strategy that is actually has to do a lot with PREVENT. And PREVENT is, uh, I will just break it down for people who might have not heard about it, perhaps. So PREVENT uh, has four pillars. Actually, it's, it's a part of a broader concept of a counterterrorism strategy that is called CONTEST. And PREVENT is one of these pillars. So it's PREVENT, PURSUE, PROTECT, and PREPARE. All of these four pillars are, in fact, working within the communities 
themselves. Most of the people that come to work in these programs are coming from within the communities themselves. We're talking about healthcare providers, we're talking about imams in mosques sometimes, we're talking about people from municipalities of all kinds, and about social workers, etc. And now, as we've seen in February 2023, one of the new programs that was, uh, in fact, uh, decided upon by the Council of Europe includes such a thing, it includes prevent. So I think that this is a very good challenge to be set upon, and uh, we have a lot uh, to look forward to, because the thing is that the challenges have shifted. If before, like you just said, Lorenzo, we had to deal with terrorist attacks, attacks physical more than others, today it's, it has shifted to ideological um, and, um, and, and, and even more serious threats somehow uh, through the networks, through uh, social networks. And today we're not, about, we're not talking about simple so social networks like Facebook or Twitter or even Telegram. Today we're talking about encrypted social networking. And they have a lot to do with the new wave of terrorism that is basically well, it will come. We understand that this would happen. We are talking about waves. So the next wave would be much more technological. It would need better challenges, better, uh, better examples, and perhaps better prevention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to Conrad Adenauer Stiftung and also to ICT. I just want to say a huge thanks to uh, Boas and Stevie and all the volunteers who are doing a wonderful job here. So give them a hand. I'm going to take you up uh, to, uh, through a threat assessment in the north, in the cold north, Sweden that uh, was mentioned, uh, the Scandinavian countries and Nordic countries. And, you know, we have been in a, in a calm bay but we, in a stormy world, but we are now in the eye of the storm. Um, it's mainly, of course, due to the Quran burnings, who have, which are um, very frequent, uh, both in Denmark and in, in Sweden. In fact, in Denmark, it's more frequent than in Sweden, but it's getting more media coverage. Uh, but I, I want to sort of situate this threat because it is important, because it, it fuels the narrative that the, that the um, West and, and now Sweden and Denmark is at war with Islam. Uh, this began for, in the Swedish case, uh, in January 2022, when there was a campaign, uh, a malign influence campaign that was directed against Sweden, and the, basically the narrative was that the Swedish social services were kidnapping Muslim kids, um, placing them with pedophiles or other um, maltreatment. Uh, now, you would think that this is not a big, you know, uh, influence campaign, but it, it actually spread uh, virtually to, through super influences in the, in the uh, uh, Salafi Muslim world. Uh, all the networks, um, um, like Al Jazeera, TRT as, uh, as well, were um, promoting uh, this sort of narrative that, uh, that, that the West and Sweden are at, 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 at um, war with Islam. We mapped this campaign and we are seeing now that uh, it is part of a broader conflict with the West over several issues uh, like uh, LGBT, uh, we have now a bias in uh, France, uh, Islamophobia in, in, in the West, uh, where you have foreign states that are using influence operations. So there are multiple conflict vectors that are going to be, and, and of course, being one of the most liberal parts of liberal democracies in the world up in the North, we are, of course, becoming very vulnerable. Um, everyone has been getting in on the act in relation to the Quran burnings and, 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 and you know, painting us in a, in a very sort of uh, hostile way against Muslims and Islam. Uh, we've had the, conference, the Organization of Islamic Conference with its 57 members. Um, luckily, uh, we are not seeing a boycott campaign, but that is, of course, serious. Iran is pushing out a very um, heavy narrative and are involved in this, as, as well as Hezbollah uh, and Muqtada al-Sadr, uh, of course, uh, stormed the Swedish embassy in, in Baghdad. When it comes to threats, um, the most serious one is, of course, through Al-Qaeda's Central Command. And they came out with a three-page communique recently through Asahab. Um, they talked about slaughtering diplomats in the Middle East. They talked about uh, 
killing all those involved in the Quran burnings, um, um, specifically also targeting the police, and we of course seen that in, in, in other conflicts. They talked about uh, the West have not learned the lessons of Charlie Hebdo, and that as such, Al-Qaeda needs to discipline uh, uh, the West. Uh, and most significantly, uh, we talk about lone actors, but they talked about establishing a three-man cell to ensure that Al-Qaeda is back in business. In other words, we are now regarded as targets so that both ISIS and Al-Qaeda would, would, would consider us to be, you know, you're back in business if you, if you manage to strike uh, uh, at us. I'm just going to I just want to say two more things. Sorry. Um, one is that we see a connectivity between um, violent extremism and nonviolent extremism. Sorry, uh, we, we, we see connectivity between nonviolent and violent extremism. It is not enough to tackle violent extremism because, the, uh, as the, the head of counterterrorism at the Swedish Security Service have, have said, uh, the wave uh, underneath, if, if the violent extremism is the crest of the wave, the wave underneath is, um, is propelling, providing the torque, pushing forward, undermining some, maybe not violently, but under, undermining some democratic values. And we have to be cognizant of the fact that there are Islamist factors that are challenging core democratic issues over the long term, and, and that may be, become problematic. There's also a trend towards the weaponization of Islamophobia. I see this in academia. Uh, where you have um, the challenge not only against counterterrorism studies, um, the hardcore, the old guard, so to speak, I wish I'm, I'm part of the panelist part of this, um, but you're also seeing this that uh, extremists are getting academic degrees to be uh, uh, and using academia as a platform to undermine the credibility of some of these programs, like Prevent, uh, etc. Uh, I could talk about financing and the importance of that, and let me just say that we highlighted this issue, and, and many countries have not done enough in relation to uh, undermining um, Islamist uh, funding. Uh, when uh, recently, when Abu Rashid uh, was in uh, Malmo, we highlighted his role uh, in relation to the, the, the funding issue and his alleged role in, in, in Hamas funding, and of course, there's now a current case in, in the Netherlands. Lastly, let me say about the, the um, uh, right-wing extremism, because we haven't talked about that. I know there's a panel on this as well. And you have the hybridization of um, right-wing extremism. It's not just about neo-Nazis, but you have a whole assortment of um, uh, conspiracy theories, anti-government, incels, etc. It's a big whirlpool of issues, and we shouldn't disregard that, because we are well aware in the Nordic sphere that Anders Bering Breivik um, you know, did a tremendous uh, atrocity as well. So we need to protect our Jewish institutions. We need to protect uh, also mosques against uh, attacks, uh, because at the end of the day, the contest strategy you were referring to is about managing down the polarization in society and creating resilience and getting back to normality. I'm done now. Yeah, thanks uh, to Reichmann, thanks to the Adenauer Foundation for the invitation. Uh, this is a great panel. It's great to see you guys. Um, I will um, talk about Europe, but from a German perspective. Uh, and one of the most uh, interesting observations to me in recent years was that returnees from Syria and Iraq do not seem to be the biggest problem. Most of them do not go back to per perpetrating attacks, um, at least in the face since 2017, when we haven't seen any major, major attacks. But I would like to talk about three points. First, what I do see in my work is a new social base of jihadist terrorism in Europe in recent years. We all got used to the fact that Tunisians and Moroccans French citizens, Belgian citizens, Dutch citizens, German citizens of these origins uh, pose a special problem in the ISIS years. But 
New social base, what I mean is that we do see, see networks now of recent arrivals. People who arrived mainly between 2014 and 2016 in Europe who pose the biggest problems. And that is part of this first observation. The, the observation is it's not the returnees, but it's refugees or call them migrants, whatever you want to call them. And it's locals who did not manage to go to Syria and Iraq, partly because they were kept on the continent by the security authorities, partly because, because they were simply too young to go, who have tried to perpetrate attacks since 2017. And the most interesting ones are not the Syrians, who are very active. The Iraqis sometimes, and the Afghans who try to perpetrate attack. The most, uh, the most interesting ones are Central Asians, in many cases Tajiks, and I think the guy in Stockholm that we already talked about, Akilov, was the first example, an Uzbek citizen of Tajik, uh, ta uh, of Tajini, Tajik uh, ethnic, uh, ethnicity. But these are Tajiks uh, who, pose a, who pose a threat, who have uh, plotted several attacks uh, in Germany in recent years, although unsuccessfully. They cooperate with Caucasians, Caucasians in the European meaning of the word, meaning people from the Caucasus, Chechens, they are often called, um, often with, the, with an organized crime back, background. And to make the thing a little bit more vivid, very young Albanians or Austrians, Germans, Belgians of Albanian origin in North Macedonia and other countries. I've been working on, this, on these networks for some years now, and they are the most active. And it shows a phenomenon, um, and I think, I, I think it's, it's part of a phenomenon of globalization of jihadist terrorism. We, it started with the Egyptians in the 1970s, then came the Saudis. In 1998, the North Africans, then came the Turks. And now we, we sometimes do see nationalities that we don't even think about as part of the problem becoming active namely Tajiks, Caucasians, and Albanians working together. It sounds weird, uh, but they are the most dynamic force among jihadists, at least in Germany, in Austria, and the Balkans. That's the new social base. Secondly, and that makes this phenomenon a lot more dangerous, is a new organization that is aiming at perpetrating attacks in Europe. In Germany, our security services talk about Africa, Okay, fair enough, that's a problem. But we do not have an organization that aims, right now, explicitly aims at perpetrating attacks in Europe. The organization that does that is ISIS Khorasan, and it has done so repeatedly by contacting its supporters, namely the Tajiks that I have just mentioned. ISIS Khorasan is extremely popular with, uh, with Central Asians all over the world, and many of them have used the open borders of Europe between 2014 and 2016 to enter the continent. We all realized that Syrians were coming. I never realized that Tajiks were coming until they plotted the first attacks in late 2018, early 2019. So, new social base, new organization, and thirdly, what is important is new tactics. It's not so new, and the practitioners uh, am among you will all know it, um, and I'm talking about the directed attacks. But I want to stress that this is probably the most important innovation of ISIS in the international, for international terrorism in recent years. It means that the organization, after the Brussels attacks, has nearly exclusively relied on trying on a, on a tactic in which it tried to coach people which did not manage to go to Syria, did not manage to go to Afghanistan or some other place to get trained, but to coach them in terrorist tactics, in ideology, and whatever is needed in order for them to perpetrate an attack. That was already uh, important in... Uh, I'll stop in 30 seconds. That was already the modus operandi 
uh, in the Berlin attacks in December 2016. It was the modus operandi in Stockholm in, I think it was April 2017. And it has remained the modus operandi for ISIS Khorasan. There is an organization in Afghanistan that is strong that is trying to direct people, to coach people to perpetrate attacks. And if we take a look at the situation in 2016, it becomes clear that by directing people, it makes lone wolf actors. These organizations make lone wolf actors a lot more dangerous than they have ever been. I personally never believed in inspired um, terrorism, in lone wolf actors, but right now they have become a danger because there is a new tactic, new social base, new organization that is dangerous, new tactics. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I know it's a real challenge to keep to the time. Uh, we, we're really under, under serious time constraints. But we do have time for, for a little bit more, and, and that's really great because I know you only touched uh, the sur scratched the surface right now. Uh, and, and again, thank you for this first round of, of thoughts. Um, so so we, we've, we speak, we've spoken mainly so far what's going on in Europe, which makes sense, right? Because we're talking about threats to Europe, but threats to Europe could also mean threats coming from outside of Europe. And so today it's 9-11, and of course, uh, you know, it's important to, to remember, and we, I, don't, I don't think we will ever forget. Um, but, but that is an event that took place outside of Europe, which had many repercussions in Europe, and of course shaped uh, the landscape of terrorism for many years following those events. And, and uh, Lorenzo, you mentioned also, of course, the, the war in Syria, which too had major impact. Again, an out of Europe event, which has a major impact in how terrorism, what terrorism looks like inside Europe. So I want to ask um, you a question which has to do with, with that, right? The implications of, of events that might influence um, what happens with terrorism inside Europe, but maybe come from outside. Like, uh, that could be, for example, hopefully at some point, the end of the war in Ukraine, right? Uh, where we have a lot of weapons that have been uh, brought to Ukraine. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers, a lot of people who got a lot of skills. Could that have any kind of impact on what will happen in the next decade. Or uh, looking at the Sahel, which Europe you know, sometimes forgets, but in general remembers is a major uh, point of, of instability, which could uh, very quickly um, bring to waves of immigration or uh, you know, kind of uncontrolled migration and, and, and instability and radicalization in the process. So um, it doesn't have to be any of these two examples, but I'm wondering if you can think of of what would be some vectors of, of uh, change to uh, what we see now with terrorism in Europe that would maybe um, you know, come from the US. You mentioned the far-right extremism, which is a global trend, uh, Magnus, but it could be, uh, could be other, other things as well. So you want to take this one? Maybe I wasn't so eloquent when I was uh, You're trying very to... very eloquent. No, no, when I was trying to explain that um, we already have those vectors. Those vectors are that... Um, I mean, our, our core values is democracy, rule of law, and respect for individual rights and freedoms, including gender equality. Now, what Sweden has experienced, and also, of course, Denmark and other countries have experienced, is that, that you, you're facing a world that doesn't think that way. It's religious norms, it's collectivistic thinking, uh, and, and so on. So you have clashes. You have cl actually clashes. Now, those are used to mobilize communities. They also radicalize communities, etc. So now we have, I mean, we, we have, against Sweden, Denmark, we have Al-Qaeda uh, Central Command. Uh, we have Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. We have ISIL Khorasan, who are directing threats against Sweden and Denmark. We have Al-Shabaab. We have uh, Iran and Hezbollah. Uh, so, you know, all the vectors are focusing in on, you know, two small countries, uh, that uh, they say, look, we need to, to uh, strike at them. If we strike at them, we are back in business, right? So Al-Qaeda is back in business. ISIL is back in business, etc. So it doesn't sort of, you know, it's not, it's not just creeping. Mm -hmm. When it comes to those guys, you, you mentioned the Tajiks and others, they're also coming through Ukraine to Poland. And so, and you have other, and Germany. Uh, so you have, there are many things already here. And sometimes we think about, I learned this from the Swedish Security Service, there's so much focus on sort of like foreign fighters, uh, right. right? But we, have a, we have already have an infrastructure in Europe. We have ecosystems in Europe. 
and those are cross boundaries. Therefore, Europol is an important institution. Other cross, you know, the partnerships is so important. But we are facing a challenge because many of them are, are we, have, we have caught, we have good coverage of them, but they, we put them away and they're coming out of prison and they start to radicalize again. Again, yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Magnus. Lorenzo and then Dina and then Guido, if you want to say if you Very briefly. I mean, as I said, historically, it's always been external conflicts uh, that trigger the, they change the size and the sort of the direction of, of jihadism in, uh, in Europe. Uh, I'm very mindful that things can change and I think some uh, domestic events, for example, like the situation in Sweden that Magnus uh, outlined, I think we've had incidents like that in the past, uh, um, but they never really determine things, maybe for one individual countries. I think as we're getting to a larger social base of jihadism in, in Europe, as we have some of the old timers, some of the very people that shaped, I mean, a German setting individuals like Pierre Vogel, that really uh, shaped the mobilization in Germany and have gotten smarter in creating a social base and how to operate. Uh, I think it might be internal events that can shape that. Uh, I would add to what Guido was talking about and you know, my, my Italian origin might add to that in the focus on immigration. Now, if I look at the previous decade, Europe exported jihadism largely. If we look at the mobilization for Syria, uh, Europe is the continent that uh, uh, per capita contributed the most uh, by large uh, to the mobilization for, for Syria with five, 6,000 individuals. Uh, over the last few years, though, we've started importing relatively large numbers. Uh, now, I'm very mindful of how uh, polarized uh, and manipulated this debate is, how heated it is, how controversial it is, and there's no question that the vast majority of people that come to, to Europe as migrants, refugees, and so on have nothing to do with radicalization and terrorism, but I think we can list, uh, we have a long list of cases in which, whether it's the the Paris attackers that infiltrated the flow from, uh, uh, from the east, uh, whether we had individuals who came to Lampedusa or to, 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 uh, and made their way up, uh, like in the case of Berlin, uh, we have a long list of that. And I think working on the immigration part of it is something that is difficult to do, obviously, for both political and logistical reasons, but I think a key component to it. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful, I think. Dina? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'd like to uh, relate to what Guido said about Tajiks. So Tajikistan basically was under the Soviet rule for 70 years. And uh, it still has a lot to do with um, the Russian Federation for, on, the, on the one hand. On the other hand, it has a lot to do with Afghanistan. And many of the Tajiks that are coming right now from Central Asia to Europe, to different European countries, we need to say this out loud. We are talking about people who came either from Afghanistan or from Tajikistan, but the parts that were affected by Al-Qaeda enclaves at the time, in the beginning of the uh, 21st century. We're talking about people who were radicalized long ago. We're not talking about, obviously, all of the Tajiks, but we need to attend to the specific organizations within Tajikistan or within the Tajiks inside of Afghanistan that were related uh, or either to Al-Qaeda or to ISIS and then ISIS Khorasan. We know that some people have pled allegiance first to Al-Qaeda and then to those two organizations. And we're talking about the same um, basis uh, of people. So when we speak about Central Asia, we need to attend to one of these, uh, we'll say, uh, components that Daphne, you have mentioned. We're talking about all uh, kinds of different uh, vectors that might uh, make a difference. So the war between Russia and Ukraine, the aggression, the Russian aggression in Ukraine is actually affecting this. It is radicalizing the whole area, the whole post-Soviet area. And I'm saying this not only as an expert in extremism in post-Soviet era, but also as a person who was born in the Soviet Union at the time. So we can say that this is a huge vector of radicalization and radicalism, and this radicalism is exported to all kinds of places, not just to Europe, but also to the US. And uh, it would be funny even to say that, but to the Middle East as well, because not all of the terror is coming from the Middle East. Obviously, a huge part of it is coming from Central Asia. We need to attend to this. Thank you. That's very, that's very good. Thank you, Guido. Yeah, first, uh, uh, Lorenzo, I think, was, was too polite uh, when he talked about the migration problem. We do have governments in U Europe, among them my own government, who don't take the secu security dimension of what is happening seriously. That was the case between 2014 and 2016, when some attacks only happened because borders were open. 
including Paris and Brussels, uh, and, it, and it's the case now. Um, it, migration has a security dimension. That's uh, point number one. Second, Ukraine is extremely important. Um, some of those that we are taught, that I have talked about, who are alleged to have plotted attacks recently, came from Ukraine. It was Russian-speaking ISIS personnel who fled Syria to Ukraine. Why? Because Ukraine was, was <laughs> and partly is still Russian-speaking, it was totally chaotic and it was corrupt. So it was ideal for them uh, to survive to survive over there. When the war started, they went to a better place, which was chaotic but not corrupt. That was Germany. Um, that, my, what, that is my point, point uh, number, number two. And the third one, and uh, perhaps that is in this surroundings the more important one, um, I think I do not think in terms of conflict, but I do think in terms of organizations. We see a very fragmented jihadist scene worldwide. And if, if I was a German jihadi or a European jihadi, I would not know exactly where I should look to. Should I take a look at Jainim? Mm, very hard to access. Should I, should I take a look at ISIS Khorasan? Should I take a look at HTS, perhaps, in, uh, in Syria, or even uh, Tandim Horraz ad din THD? Um, and if this situation changes, if we have a new, an organization that is gaining a position of prominence in the jihadist movement, like ISIS did between 2013 and 2017, that, I think, is when the situation will change and everything that is now very fragmented, very cha chaotic, will probably change, and then we'll have a new threat emerging comparable to what we've seen in recent years. I think that's very interesting. It goes back to Lorenzo point, Lorenzo's point, actually, in the beginning, when you said, you know, we don't see the direction that we've had, we had like five years ago, but if either some organization kind of like manages to ramp up its popularity and get everyone to rally, you know, within it or some new player coming, then that would provide the, and, and maybe building on some of the vectors that, that you guys uh, discussed, maybe the Tajiks or Ukraine. Well, we, we have to hope for, for that it does not happen, right? But, um, but I think that's a very interesting assessment of the situation uh, today and, um, and, and also for what we can, uh, we can expect for, for the future and what we have to look for in terms of trends. And, uh, and I think this is very helpful to, to everyone here. So I would like to uh, thank you very much, all of you, for keeping to the time and uh, giving us a lot of food for thought. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you all for listening. And um, this uh, ends uh, our panel. Thank you again to the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung and to the Deputy Ambassador for being with us today. Um, uh, enjoy, everyone. Bye -bye.